This is Peter Walsh, Saturday Sports. Need a garage, shed, carport or veranda? There's only one name to remember. Olympic Industries, built to last. Oh, plenty happening in the world of sport. Before our special guest, Jenny Williams, the Matildas World Cup preparations have been dealt a blow with the head coach, Alan Studgett, terminated from the role a short time ago. The Football Federation just confirmed he's gone five months before the World Cup. FFA Chief Executive David Gallup said the decision comes after an internal review into the team's culture. We'll have more on that on 1395-588 throughout the afternoon. So we jump all over the shop, but at last we've got something positive. We've got Jenny Williams who's (laughs) popped in to say hello, Jenny. It's a welcome to you and thank you for being patient because uh, it happens at a bit of a hurry in this particular studio. It's a bit like that, isn't it? But how can I not come? Because, you know, my brother Stephen always says, well, she's one of the greatest guys around (laughs) who I've ever worked with. So lovely to pop in. It's really nice to have you on board. And I was just trying to think about the way in which I'd introduce you because of the multi-skilling that that you Mm -hmm. have been able to take on board in, not just performing at different sports, but away from the sport you're a people person you are a communicative person and I was thinking about it this morning and I thought all right let's just do a role play I'm saying to you you're going to write a book Mm -hmm. and the book is about Jenny Williams now you're going to sell this book and you're going to go to a half a dozen plus another half a dozen plus another half a dozen publishers And you're going to have to say to them, this is the most important chapter in the book, the first one, because when people pick it up and read it, I want them to continue reading it. What would you say to open up, what would you say about yourself at the start of a book that would have been the most significant thing? I know it's a tough one. I've given you no warning on this one. You've done so many things. What would you say? What would feel would make you feel comfortable? Well, the really interesting thing is, Pete, when I did write a book, I didn't even title it with Jenny Williams. I titled it J.A. Williams because every bit of research shows that if I'm a female trying to pitch it about myself, the chances of it being picked up by a publisher are very, very low. So um, when you're asking me what would I say... Um, Look, one of the questions I ask people is, you know, modesty is something that we should all have. But at some point, if you do not sell yourself, um, someone else will sell themselves, even if they're not as educated or even if they're not as good at what it is. So what would I say? Probably um, I spent a lifetime being lucked into parents that were both driven and really caring, and it allowed me to flourish in many areas. And that was especially then having three brothers allowed me to learn how to play (laughs) two-on-one. Was it competitive with the brothers? Yeah, always, you Mm. know, and that's why when we were young, um, I always laugh because I show a a, um, picture of our house that Mark and I now live in and it had a a straight down the passage to right, left, right, and we used to fight. (laughs) (laughs) And so it taught me to be quite good and Mm. and also quite uh, good at dodging and patience because then I'd lock myself in the toilet and outlast the boys before I came back out again. Mm. But um, probably to go with that, then I started to realise that um, I knew a lot, but I saw it from my own point of view, and I read a guy um, only a few years ago named Daniel Kahneman who won a Nobel Prize, and he's an old psychologist who won it for economics. And economics is my other subject. And when I started to look at how human behaviour, we all think we'll do the right thing. We all think we'll stand out when we need to. But we are far too likely to go along with the herd, and the herd can be completely wrong. So I then started to... I went back, did a um, grad dip in psychology, a master's in psychology, and... I am one of those people that goes, you can't only know about yourself. You know, you need to know a context within society. So the book would be about what were the lessons that Jenny learned, but also then put it in the context of most people are average and it's great to be average sometimes. Guess what? Everyone needs to not be a perfectionist. But if you want to be the best at anything, and I call it being a champion, but it's a champion parent, it's a champion um, swimmer, it might be a champion in a team sport. You have to know how to deal with other people and it's not just you yourself, it's you within a group. Understood. All right, we're staying with the role play. Right. You're in the kitchen with Mark. Yeah. And he's made you a cup of tea, as is his <laughs> he want. He does. He'd do this, would he? He does that. <laughs> he actually is very good at that. You've got to try chai tea. That's very good, <laughs> just as an aside. The front door, there's a tap tap. Yep. The back door, there's a tap tap. At the front door, Bernard Tomic. And at the back door, Leighton Hewitt. And they both come in, and you're sitting at the table with Mark, and they sit down. What would you do? 
First of all, wouldn't that be nice? Secondly, um, I actually know Leighton. I taught Leighton when he was very young, and his sister Jazz is someone that I know very well. And 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 um, again, I then I'd tell Bernard that I actually knew Leighton because again, that you can't be dishonest with people, you know, in, in how relationships are. But at the same time. When you ask me, you know, what would I do then? I would actually sit down and say, this is who I am. And we would try and find some common ground to start off with. We may not even be talking about tennis. We might be talking about the latest superhero movie or what um, what they'd been watching on TV. And for me, one of the things is things like even the Super Bowl, going along and having a look yes. at it. And then talking about human relationships because... <sighs> It's no different to a marriage. It's like when people say, oh, always be honest. Elite honesty I see is on the cricket wall. And I go, what the heavens is that? Mm. There is, you know, like the truth is if you want a relationship with people, you have to build it up so that you have trust between you. And the trust comes from communication right from when you first meet. And that means uh, sometimes you might be gentle in how you give your feedback. Some, most of the time I'll be, you'll be putting an arm around them. But first of all, you need to teach people about human relations. So I even have a young man and his mum who will come and see me and they don't see the world from each other's point of view. And teaching people, first of all, not only do we need to do that, but then we actually need to look at, well, you're playing for Australia or you're playing for yourself. And what I would like to say to Tommy, and I don't know him, so, again, my opinion is based on what I see, and that's not always right, by the way. Um, but what I would be saying is t- tennis is giving him money and fame, but they don't last a lifetime. What will is the relationships and the people that you grew up with. And, you know, like um, for me, someone like Darren Cale, I can see him and pick up and have a chat about anything at any time because we grew up as a footballing group, but it wasn't only football people were interested in. It was a lot of things. So the first thing is, number one, it's got to where it has when it shouldn't have. And uh, it was interesting you just talking about the Matildas sacking their coach. All the way through when there's an appointment, and I do this in sport when I'm working in my business as an organisational psychologist, if I'm um, profiling and then appointing someone, one of the biggest things is you need to evaluate as you're going along. And that means also... um, anonymous clickers. So I'll give you an example. When Mark was sacked in 2010 and the media was saying he didn't have the players, I was actually working as a psychologist. Now, I'm his sister. So no, of course you can't ask people and expect them to give me an answer that's fair. Except when we had, we brought in a whole lot of clickers that had one to ten and we could ask all questions and it was all anonymous. So the feedback I could give the club was actually based on anonymous feedback that the players felt like they weren't going to get repercussions from anything. And it actually gives a much fairer picture than what the media see or what we see out in public. And that's where I think this has gotten too far because nothing was done early enough. No, OK, OK. Well, let's take it now another step further because I, I want to in detail, and we're going to chat for quite a while, the sports that you not only were involved in but you played so well in. I don't want to go there at the moment. Why the challenge then of undertaking, I want to talk to these people, I want to motivate this person, I want to take this person aside and sit down and see whether or not I can be okay. There's so many clubs that have looked to Jenny Williams because they know that you have the skills to be able to get a message across. You have the skills to be able to take someone by the hand and walk them through what might be some broken glass but you can do that. That isn't just because you've got a <laughs> psychologist sheet. It's because that's got to be natural in your skills and abilities. It's, it's a learned and it's a practice ability. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, I talk to people about this. I was a captain coach from when I was 21, and people say, oh, you're a natural. But you have to also look. I spent 20 years with my dad watching him coach and also watching my mum mediate people who didn't like my dad or who said Port Adelaide people were terrible. So I got to see how people would form opinions, and they weren't right. And I never hero-worshipped any footballers because I saw the best and I saw the worst in many of them but at the same time I saw that the love and the care was the thing that made a difference and you didn't always make necessarily the league team or you may not have been the best but you were regarded as a person and you know that that's probably one of the challenges that um, I was talking to someone who said you know you've got plenty of work and I said yes but it's generally with individuals and what I like to do is say 
we can bring whole teams up in how we communicate, how we do things better as a group, and it's much more effective as a psychologist than working one-on-one because that's a bit like trying to put your finger in the dam instead of actually going, well, is the dam built properly? Uh, mm. Is the dam on good foundations? And so, um, like last year, I've got to say, one of the, my greatest joys was working with North because not only were the players willing to come along and I won't bore anyone, I will make sure that they learn, they love it, and th- they end up better people because of it, but also the coaches were totally on board with how do we do this better, and Josh is great like that because this is this whole thing of Kahneman again, most of his work was based on what you see is all there is. So most people coach like they were coached or parent like they were parented. And instead I'm saying there's a whole other world out there and there's new experiments to try. And young people are not, like everyone says, lazy or anything else like that. They're exactly like we were. But you've got to find people who want to tell them, life is great, come along, do some extra work for me. I'm going to help you get better. My job's not to tell you how bad you are because most kids are already doing that to themselves yes, in their head yep. anyway. Anyway, so the job is to actually say, how do I actually make you better and how can I use my wisdom of my age but my enthusiasm to keep getting better myself to actually help you get better? Jenny Williams is our guest, our special guest on 1395 5AA. We'll return in just a sec. I want to ask you, when you started our chat, you talked about men and women and maybe there was a, a little bit of a difficulty for women to find niches in certain jobs. Maybe they weren't recognised for their ability soon enough. Now things might be changing. I love promoting women's sport for lots of reasons, and one is they want to be promoted. One is if you ring someone and you say, excuse me, would you uh, give someone an interview, etc.? Women are amazing. Sometimes men are a little bit too precious. Did you find that now? You are such a respected person in the community because of your skills... Did that respect start straight away or did you have to work through different things? Yeah, it's an interesting question because people ask me about women's sport all the time and um, I felt like in the 80s we were actually quite well looked and regarded and, in fact, whenever you went to things, um, you were invited to talk and, and your opinion actually counted. When There were two newspapers and Marg Ralston was actually the yeah. um, editor of one and so we got great coverage. So when we went away with lacrosse, we had two female journalists sent along, away with this every year and the other thing there was a great cross-pollination in South Australia between the women's sports people and so even people like Rachel Spawn and Screeny and Erin Phillips were younger girls but we got to talk to them and I would go along and actually see the lightning so we got to know each other well and it's interesting when you say about regard because even working with North last year, I have not had one person ring me, you're now talking to me about it, to ask me what we did differently. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? Because I would always go, Jenny, Josh is the coach and the players are great too, but maybe there was a couple of little things we did differently. Mm. No one's asked me. Do and you... I would go back to going, for me, that's a strange thing no, because okay. I'm sure if I was a bloke, people would go, oh, what did mm. you do? And instead it's like, oh, yeah, you're probably just on the periphery. What did you do differently? Ah, well, again, it was working with all of them together to look at how do we actually become the best we can be, not only as individuals, which I call the star themselves, but then the star within the people around them, which is coaches, media and everything. How do you stay big? And the last thing is learning a little bit about social psychology. So um, things like social loafing. I don't know. Have you ever heard of that, Walter? I just loaf. I don't know about the social <laughs> side of it, but I can, I can well, I understand the loafing expression. <laughs> well, the loafing is an interesting one because it's the reason why when you look at a, a diagram on how to stay in the flow, if, for instance, um, I'm in a winning team and we're winning all the time, but you're in the ballpark where we beat you all the time, what often happens is everyone in my team, when we're playing you, just takes their foot off the pedal just a little bit because I'm thinking, oh, yep. the player next to me is going to play well. I, I'm okay. The player. And it allows the teams who are lower to actually go ahead or beat the teams who are higher because the others are all just a little complacent. And once you start to understand that, you address it beforehand. You go, oh, that's when you might need to set a few goals in instead of worrying about... And that was the other thing, is I find everyone worries about talking about finals. So I've walked in there and said, the first thing we're going to do is talk about we want to make the finals. Mm. That's this... I was never scared of the finals. We play because of finals, because that's what we want to be great in. And that's where we need to teach people. Great champions are never scared of the finals word. (laughs) They're never scared of going, we're going to play well today. We're going to play well for the rest of uh, this chat without question. And when we come back, I want to talk to you about, all right, you achieve success at a football club. 
They win by 19 points. They win and they celebrate. What can they do to at least maintain that standard the following year because players have been drafted, the coach is still there? Let's just wait and see. Jenny Williams, our special guest on 1395, 5AA. 95, 5AA. 95, 5AA. 95, 5AA. This is Peter Walsh, Saturday Sports. Need a garage, shed, carport or veranda? There's only one name to remember. Olympic Industries, built to last. 1395, 5AA. Uh, outside, I think it's all right, but we don't see much of it in the studio, but I'm reliably informed that the weather is OK, although the clouds are building in the Matildas World Cup camp. Preparations have been dealt a significant blow with head coach Herman Stutchik terminated from the role. It has been confirmed by WFA and that's David Gallup who passed on that information. And I noted too, Jenny, that you were bouncing on the desk with the, the music that was ah, taking your fancy. Now, <laughs> and look, when I, as I said, trying to work out the interview, I don't like to have everything in my mind <laughs> like the ducks have been aligned. Music, does that play a role with you at all? Oh, Wilty, you've just got one of the best things. That, um, one of the areas that I teach is this flow diagram, and people need to understand to stay in that, to feel like you're a god when you're playing, to feel like you can mm. um, influence the scoreboard. You need to know how to manipulate your heart rate. Now, um, one of the best things to do that is actually music and mood. And most people don't actually understand that words you listen to are really subliminally going in your head. And secondly, the beat that it is can make a difference to how you respond to that. And, you know, it's funny, I was saying to someone, I don't even have to do a big warm-up even now to go out and play something because if I get a song in my head, my heart rate starts going Well, higher. you know the obvious questions <laughs> that are coming up. I'll give us your three two-and-ones for the songs that you like that you feel the need to play and you think yourself, the heart rate... See, my heart rate is out of control when I take the three grandchildren out shopping because I think to myself, well, the wallet's going to bounce around and I'm not going to be able to control myself. That's my heart rate, but what music turns uh, you into whatever? Well, it's, it's, sometimes it might be turning me into getting, you know, like, oh, yes, I'm ready to go. Okay. Sometimes it might be, I oh, calm down, you know. And so uh, for me, I always laugh because, like, Spirit in the Sky, anything from the um, Remember the Titans soundtrack, like, ain't no mountain oh, high yes. enough. I'm ready to go. John Mellencamp, the song that he had when we were kids was um, Minutes to Memories, and it says, Days turn to minutes and minutes to memories. Life slips away the dreams we have planned. You are young and you are the future. Mm -hmm. So suck it up, tough it out, well, and be so the best you can. you've got that in your mind because that's something that registers with you and you need to remember that. Absolutely. Well, yeah. and this is where teaching young people, when they feel bad, so you've just got dropped or um, yeah, relationships go wrong, and people forget that too. They often think footballers and um, netballers and everyone are robots. And in fact, you know, if your dog dies or something goes wrong with your family, that can also I influence how you're going to go on the day. So learning all of this beforehand gives you a chance to get your mind and your heart where it needs to be. And that's probably the best thing I do is link heart and head rather than I'm, I was a PE teacher before I was a psychologist. And I worked out if you don't want to be injured, be in the flow zone. So in other words, I don't pull muscles, even though I don't do big injuries. And I say to people, look at dance floors when people get up there. If it's good music, you don't see people pulling calves and hurting themselves, no, despite true. the fact that they dance around. And if you are actually anxious or angry, no matter how well you've prepared or no much how much warm-up you've done, your muscles are still not prepared to where they should be for actual competition. And that's why I see people getting hurt in elite competition because they're actually worried about what's going to happen and they don't know how to deal with it. Okay, okay. Now, we have a little program each week and I think uh, Dean Sullivan, who's the memorabilia man, he's just come into the studio and he comes in and he shows off his bits and pieces and we go down Vinyl Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember the first vinyl that you got? Yeah, Nancy Sinatra. These boots are made oh, for walking. Oh, <laughs> really? And what's that? Lee Hazelwood, wasn't it? <laughs> no, Nancy so? Sinatra oh, when I was a kid, definitely. Oh, okay. Yeah, these boots are made for walking. And so, and that's you just know, like, what they'll do. do. <laughs> and uh, it's funny, when you think about me as a person, you go, maybe that was an influence <laughs> on my life. Well, now, I want to talk about the sports that you've done so well in. And as we're doing that, I wonder about... Music playing a part in motivation, I don't know whether or not players all are along the same path. They all uh, need to be 
motivated in the same way or is it a different challenge? Oh, a completely different challenge. And that's where I said I went from what you see is all there is. In other words, for me, I could walk out onto a sports field and I tell people the only time I ever noticed I got a dry mouth was in 1989 when I hit the whacker and... Uh, all of a sudden I'm going, oh, I'm having trouble talking. That's just weird. That's not me. So I went over and did something that I teach everyone to do now and that's get a really fizzy drink, swirl it around in your mouth because, again, not only can our brain tell our body how to feel, our body can actually make our brain respond in different ways too. So, again, these are all learned things. But if you don't know and it just hits you, and you're not a bit of an experimenter. Like, I always notice things about people. So I will notice body language. I will notice what shoes people are wearing because if I need to dodge them, if they've got the wrong shoes on, I'm ready to mm. go around them. So, so much to be great. I'm finding, I, I get people who are Olympians that come and see me and say, I've never even heard of any of this thing. And I'm like, instead of taking people where a lot of people do from what's average to feeling okay, I go, this is what champion thoughts and behaviours look like. Here's how we're going to practice them. Little steps to start yes. off with. So if you get anxious um, or if you're not colourful, in other words, to be picked, you've got to be noticed. Like shirts or something oh, like that. <laughs> to be picked, you've got to be noticed. You yeah. know, if you're going to be bland, you're going to be part of the herd. Mm. So I need people and when they're not used to that well it's like pick a shirt and go and wear it and mm. get ready for everything to be yelled at you and told and you go yeah but I'm I'm actually choosing to be different I'm choosing to do that so they learn to control the anxiety and there's another thing called a centering breath which goes with the music um, and the other thing is I did a talk for Beyond Blue and there's a song that says um, you know it goes on about um, you're in the middle of the uh, of the thing, you know, like it takes some time. Little girl, you're in the middle of the ride. Everything, everything will be okay. And sometimes music speaks to kids, and we need to understand when you're feeling bad. I need you to have a good tape. I don't need you to wallow in self pity no, and no, wallow understood. in that. I need the tape to be the other way. When you're feeling great, you can listen to any music you like. But again, so we have a, a whole set of different ones, and we also have a highlight tape where they put good memories, things that they do really well, to actually to music, so that it works for businesses, it works for groups, and it works for individuals. Sharing moment, mm -hmm. Stephen. Yep. Sue. Mm hmm. What sort of music do they like? Ah, Stephen, uh, Stephen is, gee, I don't know if you know this, but we're all really good on lyrics. We can sort of sing the song of I've most songs. I've never heard songs. Stephen sing. Stephen, he will actually sing. He won't really? dance. I can't get mm. him to dance. But Stephen can almost tell you who's saying everything. And we laugh because we do the Saturday morning quiz together, a whole lot of us. <laughs> and Stephen came along one day and he even knew that Roger Whittaker sang <laughs> some sort of song in the 1970s. And we're all laughing. But again... You know, this sharing time and sharing being silly and sharing, um, you know, not being great at everything all the time gets people's confidence and makes them feel part of a group. And, you know, if you want to perform well and you want to have a great life when you're 60, teach people and, and include people and don't find reasons to leave them out of things. Mm. The challenge, uh, what you're undertaking is you're talking to individuals, but you've performed so well in the team aspect of it, um, I just look at uh, touch football, soccer, lacrosse, indoor lacrosse, Aussie rules, you name it. You also have been recognised as a Hall of Famer because people respect what you've been able to do. Was there any way that you could, you could compare as a competitor the nourishment when you walked away after achieving something in the middle of a team and feeling good, being a BNF, you've done plenty of yep. things like that. What was that like? as opposed to what you're doing now when you might be just working with, like, the North Adelaide Football Club? Oh, look, I'll give you... I get incredible vicarious enjoyment out of watching people do amazing things because it probably reminds me very much of what it was like when I was a player. You know, so, in other words, when you get old, you're not going to be able to do the great things you could do when you were younger. But if you can pass it on... And for me, two people that lived in South Australia that I would mention were um, Jade Clark and Emma Agbezi, who played for the Thunderbirds, and um, they ended up up being really good friends and staying at my house and I didn't even know them when they turned up here and um when they won the gold medal against Australia, they, Jade rang me from drug testing to say, Jen, thanks. And we'd gone through a lot of ways to treat people. And I find sport now 
women are getting paid more, the blokes are getting paid more, so everyone expects more of them because they're getting paid. But money doesn't determine performance. In fact, what determines performance is how we treat each other. And if they're not doing very well, instead of telling them off, again, I will say, help them get better. And a job as a coach is not to say, improve at this. It's actually, here's, we're going to do five different drills to improve you at that. Um, You're going to have to spend some time by yourself doing some of them. Or if you're the captain, I'm going to expect you to go out and spend time with the young guys that need to improve because that's your job as the captain not to tell them on a field how terrible they are your job as the captain is to give them help an opportunity to improve and if they choose not to do it then i have an easy thing i still love you but you're in the bees it's pretty easy yeah yeah you're in control as we speak mm-hmm. everything's going along swimmingly there's no issue are there issues in your life where you're not in control, where you're looking at, say, a team environment, where you're trying to get a message across, it's just not working, nothing is working, it's being stonewalled by a gathering or one or two, how do you cope with that? Like I would, accept, I would suggest to my athletes, first of all, you try, you try and give reason, you find out why, and if you can talk to someone to get it better, you can. But otherwise, if people actually don't want to get better and are only prepared to do it their way, I'll probably walk away and go, my talents are better where Mm. you can actually go, yes, this is worthwhile and it will change. But the biggest thing is I hate seeing miserable athletes because they've got someone in charge of them that doesn't bring the best out of them. And some coaches are absolutely technically brilliant, Pete. They are the best technicians I've seen. They would be better off just to have a uh, someone like me be in charge of the team where you, actually my job is to make everyone feel like they're gods. Your job is to develop them as uh, technicians. And um, that's a big problem at the moment because I think really good coaches sometimes are also being told by sports science people to train people this way. And I remember having an argument with someone about um, letting them wear... Uh, they were doing long-distance running at the start or hard running, and I said, let them wear headphones and some music with it. And they said, you can't wear music... There's no music in the game. And I said, yes, but there's a ball. (laughs) You know, I will chase a ball till the cows Mm. come home. And, you know, I will also do um, Red Rover all over till I'm dropping dead. But if you just ask me to do the same number of sprints, it's boring and no one puts as much time in. So, again, it's starting to think, how do you join parts of the jigsaw to make your life good? And when you talk about it, one of the things is having a home environment when I was a kid that was both loving and a little driven, but at the same time very forgiving, allowed me to be what we call more adjusted, which means I don't find things difficult, conflict I can deal with without getting really emotional about it. And to play well, you've got to be in the thinking zone. You can't be in the emotional zone. You actually have to be to influence by seeing what's going on and help others stay in that as well. We've got to ask this North Adelaide question because the Roosters supporters are (laughs) (laughs) jumping up and down. Uh, And then we'll come back and continue our chat with Jenny Williams. How are you going to improve North Adelaide? They've had the win. They've won the flag. The expectations, no idea. Josh Carr has been appointed as the state coach. Good on him too. But an amazing season. Can you replicate that? Is it silly to even think that? Or what are your thought patterns? Well, again, it's finding amazing individuals. And, you know, as a coach, I think if you can find some really good people within a team, they start to generate things themselves and they start to set standards, which aren't all about this, uh, you know, we're going to yell at people or that. They start to actually pull people up with them because they're going, this is a joyous place and we want to do extra things and we want to be there and we want to have good music beforehand. I give one of the guys at North Adelaide got all the um, the guys together and they had a big boom box and I'm just sitting there going once people learn I shouldn't have to be involved or again it's a comeback and a just a reminder and a, mm. here's some more things I've learned um, the whole thing is if you do something really well with a group it should become self-replicating especially if you've got a couple of great people there and Josh and Serge are absolutely fantastic they've got really good people now they've lost a couple that Callum Wilkie is an absolute gem. I just don't think St Kilda know how good he's going to be. And if anyone from St Kilda is listening, put him in your team because it'll make a difference. What people don't see on the outside, you can't see is how people respond to stress and how people respond to hard times. And when you get each other helping each other rather than criticising and you actually have a coach who puts good training in and then also can mix it up a little bit. We did jigsaws during the year and doing and like the fun stuff you can do to learn good team things, how you give feedback um, and also learning about each other. I'm amazed at the number of teams I go to that people can't even 
even pronounce other people's surnames that are in the team. And yet part of the care of being grey is to know about each other, to know what's going on in your life, to be able to help when you need to, who's having a baby, who mightn't have slept for the last week because they've had one. And so, again, that's not sports psych. That's actually dealing with life. Mm. And my mum would have been really good at that, even though she didn't have a degree. <laughs> she was great at a lot of these things. So yeah. I've just replicated what I've grown up with. Jenny Williams joining us on 1395 5AA. And back with some really hard questions very shortly on this Saturday afternoon. Lee on this Saturday afternoon. Lee on this Saturday afternoon. Lee on this Saturday afternoon. This is Peter Walsh. Saturday Sports. Need a garage, shed, carport or veranda? There's only one name to remember. Olympic Industries. Built to last. Hope you're enjoying our coverage of sport. Plenty of it happening. 1395 5AA will take you out onto the roads. Oh, in probably about half an hour, we've got uh, Dean, the memorabilia man, who's out there. He might have brought some vinyl in. I don't think he's got anything on Nancy Sinatra or Lee Hazelwood. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got a bit of stuff out there. He's a good man. He's and, got an uh, old tennis racket. I've oh, got a cupboard full of old wooden tennis rackets. Oh, look, you can stay for the next segment because this man, he just emerges and he's got all sorts of goodies tucked away. Now, these are not hard questions, but the biggest change in my life in terms of being a sports broadcaster has been social media. Yep. I find uh, the mobile phone I need, but there are so many occasions when I like to throw it in the Torrens River because I find that I'm being rude if I'm walking along and the phone rings and I take a call and I'm still walking and there are pedestrians going the other way and I'm thinking, this is pretty rude, but it's not just me. Everybody has got a mobile phone. I'm not sure whether or not as sports people, when they have to be really disciplined about what they have to do, do you, Jenny Williams, as someone who has to be really disciplined about the instructions, etc., do you have to police this with the way in which your athletes look after themselves on social media? Well, again, I'll go back to this care aspect. You know, it's care for other people, care for yourself and care for the result. And so there are times when mobile phones are a great thing that you can use. I love them when I need to look something up. They're really, and, you know, Google Maps if you've so got you to get around. So you cheat when you do the quiz on a Saturday morning. No, <laughs> no, no cheating on the, on the quiz. Uh, we'd do much better if we actually did. But the point is... Um, this whole thing about opinion, you know, like we're sitting on a radio station and, and they actually exist on the fact that we want everyone to have an opinion. Yes, But true. what I try and teach my athletes is not only they but everyone else doesn't actually, their opinion doesn't really count unless they're an expert in it. Unless they've done lots of hours looking at it, it tends to be just from someone else's own point of view. And, you know, if someone tells one of my athletes that they don't try hard enough or they're this, I'm going, have you actually seen what they've been doing? Have mm. you been out there? And as I said, you know, when, when the thing comes up, are oh, they paid enough for this? I'm going, sometimes they're not paid enough to be abused. Like I, I, My husband and I laugh when we go to the footy, we wonder at what amount of dollars it is that you have a right to absolutely call people names. You know, like, is yes. it five dollars? Well, or is it when you don't pay, you don't actually, you shouldn't have, you know, like, be able to abuse anyone? And we're actually, Mark and I sit there often and go, oh, oh $35 you paid in. You know, how many times can you yell at that? And what they don't get is if you actually want your team to win, be the opposite. Help them get better. Yes. Be supporters not deriders of things. And, and this is where all of a sudden when people get depression and everything, it's often because the environment that they're in is is often um, uh, a bit difficult for them in many ways. So say you're a young under-17 that's just been taken from South Australia and you're drafted into state and you're in an environment here that was great. You're around your parents who love you for who you are. You're not just the player that you and it doesn't matter if it's a netball or, or or anything but you arrive in one place and you are now just valued for your ability to kick throw or whatever and all of a sudden when things aren't going right you're not making the team or you're making the team and you've made some mistakes everyone is continually on your back and no one cares about the fact that you know like you are a nice person and you've tried hard and you've got no one who's sticking their arm around you anymore because the people you're billeted with are also what I call tragics and they only wonder about the results. So all of a sudden, people who look highly resilient and really good all of a sudden look like they can't play. Right. 
fair enough, fair enough. Now, in a quiet moment, now, firstly, Bernard Tomic's gone out the front door <laughs> and Leighton Hewitt's gone out the back door and they're still working on what their plans are for the next week or two. I'd send Mark out the front with well, one. Mark's made some back. biscuits and cheese. He's done that beautifully. Now, I'm very happy with that. He's not listening, but that's all right. No, it doesn't bake. Now, tell me if you uh, decided to put Nancy Sinatra on with these boots of made for walking and you went down memory lane and you thought about everything that you've achieved... It's like someone who barracks for a premiership. It's like Port Adelaide and they love to reminisce about 2004. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to remember every particular aspect of that game because they're cherished moments. You've had so many cherished moments. Are there any that actually fall into order of, yeah, that's the best, that was pretty good even though we didn't win, oh, look, this was playing for Australia and, yeah, I was best on ground or whatever. You've had so many. Do any... In your own mind, Jenny Williams, stand out. Um, I'll be honest. Um, Two thousand four, watching poor mm-hmm. after the amount of effort as a family, the amount of effort and time that I'd already seen my brother put in. Um, you know, and again, when we talk about being told you can't do things and everything. Um, Probably my greatest memory is taking my mum over there and, mm. and actually sharing that with my mum Beautiful. and my aunties because mum had 11 brothers and sisters and to have the aunties over there. And two years earlier when we'd lost to Collingwood over there, I had a bloke come up to right in their face saying, oh, you're losers, you're losers, to my, <laughs> you imagine my 89-year-old mother mm. having this. And I told the bloke I was a world champion. What had he ever done? Mm. So I'd had enough of things like that. But... I've got to say, afterwards, my husband, um, all of my friends that I played lacrosse with, including Cheryl, who lived in Victoria, we didn't go to the port dinner. We went to our own dinner and had our own celebration. So we were the same people who had won sport together. We still celebrate whenever we can things together. And so I will say I have great moments at Australian level, but probably my greatest moments are state and Australian, uh, state and club, because they're the people I love. I love them. They are the women who are in my life still. Um, they are the women who are my bridesmaids. Um, I've got a 20 year anniversary with the husband coming up this week. When's and that? We what date? Come on. Come on. Uh, what 20, date? Uh, I get it wrong all the time. 24th. Yeah, um, no, he's told me. Mark told me. He said he's <laughs> buying you a record. Nancy Sinatra. That's very kind of him, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we gave all the records to Mark Williams because oh, he's still got the vinyl <laughs> thing. But my whole thing is they were my brides. I had seven bridesmaids and we are still all, we love each other and we're friends and we share football. And so some of my best friends barrack for Sturt and other clubs when they were younger. I've even got best friends who's who's barrack for the Crows when they were younger and then they, you know, they came over and all we all barracked and went for things together. And I, I probably have to say when my memories, if you, if you want to have great memories, they've got to involve people. Events actually should... You know, make you feel good, yes, but it's the people that actually could still be there and stick their arms around you. And we can all be better than we ever were in our memories now. <laughs> Do you cry? Um, not very often. No, probably, probably four or five times in my life. You know, um, that's uh, not much. No, because I have a great, I have a great life, and I don't just have a great life. I, number one, I lucked into, and people underestimate luck. You, If I'd have been born into a completely different family, I may have been a completely different person. Oh, I would have been. So the luck of my mother being the most wonderful person that found the good in everything and yet stuck up for Dad when she needed to, so I saw being strong. You know, the Me Too movement doesn't suit me from the point of view that if I ever see anything wrong or something goes wrong, I'm going to go and say something about it, and I expect... And this is where my friends are great. They all will actually join in, not run away and say, oh, my God, let's hope she just takes the flack. They'll all go, no, nah, mm. this is right. We're going to stand together on all of this. So, you know, like those memories make the difference. And um, when I cry, Anthony died. Still miss my brother. Just the another really great young a great man in my life. So missed him. Um, and there have been times when, you know, like things get hard. And I think probably when I stood up for Mark in the pay, uh, Michelangelo, for instance, called me a sledgehammer. And, you know, like uh, my husband one day I just burst out crying in the cafe. And I said... I don't deserve just because I'd done all this research and we had all the clicker <laughs> information and I had all this data to be told I'm a sledgehammer for actually saying, well, in fact, what I was yeah. saying was right. And so um, it doesn't mean I like the person or, or, or dislike the person who says it, but they certainly don't understand when they're in a hard time, I will always help them. And it's strange to me that people actually don't do the other way around. 
Tenny Williams is forthright, as I knew she would be, and we'll wrap this up very shortly. So much to talk about with an outstanding individual who's done so much for sport, and we're having some fun talking with Jenny in the studios of 1395 5AA. This is Peter Walsh, Saturday Sports. Need a garage, shed, carport or veranda? There's only one name to remember. Olympic Industries, built to last. Just an update on the Tour Down Under. 107 k's remaining to finish this stage. And, of course, you've got Wollonga to say hello, how are you, and that's tomorrow. And there are three riders in a mini break. Nothing out of the ordinary, but three riders who have established a little bit of movement. I can tell you who they are. One is Clément Chivriot of France. And uh, the other two in this mini break, three of them there doing the hard work out there, but the other two in the mini break, uh, we have rider number 184, and that's from a UniSA team. That's Jason Lee, who is well, uh, well credentialed so far in this race. And the other is rider number 183, and that is Aiden Tuvey. So two UniSA riders in that three man break as they wind their way eventually to get to Strathalbyn, but they have to go past uh, Victor Harbour. Good fun. Now, Jenny Williams staying with us for just a few more minutes because we've got uh, our man on the spot. That's Dean, who is our memorabilia man. And when you see the actions of the cyclists and you sit back and look and you think, wow, the days that you were competitive in so many sports, how much enrichment would you have got just by the mere fact that you could run out there and do what you wanted to do? Uh, um and that came from, as I said, again, having brothers helped. <laughs> so uh, when you were young, and I also suppose um, it was something that, because Dad was always so busy with footy and Mum was a really good tennis player, and it was always just, um, you know, go out and play something. And so I either had to be as good as the boys or get left out. So that was probably one of the reasons, although my brothers still tell me, and they're right, that I can't kick a footy really well. <laughs> and we were laughing the other day because we put up a photo on uh, Facebook and it was all my uncle's and my brothers, and they're all in footy guernseys. And I was in just normal top. And we were saying, back in those days, girls never wore guernseys. You didn't wear them to the footy. You didn't do anything mm. like that. And I know I was never allowed out into the middle huddle at uh, three-quarter or a quarter time, just in case the language wasn't too good. So <laughs> Mum used to protect me a little bit. But at the same time, we all learnt to kick, throw, do everything else like that together. And it gave me, you know, like, as I said, just a great relationship with my brothers. And by the way, I'm really good at net and tennis because in our house, we live in Mum and Dad's old house and we've got the tennis court still and if you didn't learn to protect yourself with a tennis racket you know like that was the uh, you used to get it hit at you quite oh, a lot so yeah. you, you got pretty good at that uh, the emergence of a powerful sporting combination now when i'm talking women's football yep and it's doing really well in south australia and of course in victoria and it's filtering all over the place now. Did that surprise you? No. Um, I think it's, it was way too late here in South Australia. Um, we the, we started women's footy back in 1990, and um, in Victoria and WA, it got a lot of help. While here, it was always the second-class citizen, and the people who were running it and trying really hard didn't actually ever get any help until it became, oh, it looks like it's going to go AFL, and then all of a sudden the SNFL started and things like that. So I'm sort of always disappointed that we don't we do not do things first. We wait till some of the others do. While with things like when Jan had the lightning, I honestly believe women's basketball went ahead in leaps and bounds Correct. because yep. she was with South Australia and they were just doing extraordinary things with people and that's uh, the first Crows team disappointed me a lot because it really only had one or two South Australians in it. And you know like I would like to have seen more because having seen the women play here, there are some there were some very good women. Um, one who I think was Courtney Gum ended up playing in um, GW last year yes. and I saw her play and there's no way she shouldn't have been in the inaugural Crows side so we've lost someone that had huge potential from our state. True enough. Now I can confirm that UniSA rider Jason Lee who leads in the King of the Mountains battle is one of the three breakaways so he's doing extremely well and maintaining superiority in that position with Aidan Tuvey and Clement Chevrolet, the one, the two and the three they are working on that black tar that's spitting out a bit of perspiration. 
as they climb over the hill and they've got a fairly substantial amount of time still before they get to Strathalbyn, the second last stage of the tour in 2019. I think I could keep up with them. Oh, you could. Well, I wouldn't. Yeah, well, you know why? Because <laughs> I've got that? an electric bike. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, no, I'm saying, I, but that's one of the joys of as I get older. I, I really like cycling, but I like cycling if I've got to go to work and things like that. So having an electric bike is also a good that thing. That would be good. <laughs> it actually helps you get to where you, you still have to pedal, yeah. but it gives you an assist when you need. It does. Now, 105k to go now. The chasing peloton, not too far away from these three breakaways. You wouldn't be ex- expecting that they'd be hanging on for too long. The work done by Jason Lee was to maintain his superiority in the King of the Mountains, and that's what he's doing. All right, we're back at your place, and there's another knock at the door. Very busy, your place. Actually, um, that is a, you're exactly <laughs> right. It's exactly like that quite often. Well, Mark says, oh, excuse me, I've been doing everything for you, so you go and open the door. And there's someone there, and they have from... Uh, a parcel or whatever they give it to you and it's a couple of sporting tickets and you can go wherever you want to go you can revisit you can go back and you can look at some lacrosse or some touch or softball or anything but you can do what you want to do with a couple of tickets the tickets in effect might be for a sport that is down the track it might be the super bowl which is on towards the end of this month it might be the women's golf, which is at Grange, and we'll be talking about that a little later on. It, it might be the start of a football season with a Port playing their first game. I don't know. Do you know? Yeah, well, if you gave me going back, I'd probably go to that grand final you again would, yeah, just to feel yeah. like that. But um, also, Super Bowl, love to see that once. Although we will go to the to watch it on the big screen at Marion. We went last year. Well, it that'll was take all day. <laughs> it did take all day. Went in and out and got coffees. But again, I try and get all my athletes to watch the best in the world. Do yes. things. Doesn't matter what sport it is. You learn from them. And um, uh, probably the other one is. Um, I love Rafa Nadal. You know, he's uh, he's someone that I, I've i watched since he was young and I've always admired that he's been a bit different. And that match when he and Federer played at Wimbledon, I've got to say, uh, it was just, they played a couple. And, and just to have been there, you know, live must have been amazing for those people. But really, I'm pretty satisfied with going to anything. And I've got to say... Big screens and TVs now. I feel so blessed that, you know, I'm watching McEnroe interview Nadal last night on the TV and yes. I'm just going, wow, you know, like um, having said that, watching McEnroe years ago against... And the, it, remember when we were kids, there used to be tennis on almost New Year's Day. You'd watch it and mm-hmm. it was on the grass courts and John Newcomb and all of those. So there's so many great things and my whole thing is take joy out of whatever you can see and don't look back too much because guess what? That should just be really good feelings about there but... I, I'm new, young athletes do amazing things okay. these days. I'll leave you with this one. And again, I haven't given you any notice. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Who would you like to meet that you haven't met? Say a sports person. I'll go with a male and a female. If the door, there's these people that keep knocking on your door, tell them to go away. But you open up the door and there she is. You have a chat and then you open up the door and there he is. A sporting female and a sporting male. Again, my daughter tells me I'm one of the worst people with this question because I'll go, can't answer you. I'd like to spend a lot of time thinking about it because there's many different reasons I might want to meet people. You're not going to get any extra time, Okay, well, Serena Williams, it would be interesting to see her life, to to talk about coming from where they've come from. Um, She's now living a privileged life Mm -hmm. from probably what it would have been in the first place. Um, uh, Men... There's just so many different people. Uh, yeah, I will go back. I'll say Jesse Owens. Oh, all right, Jesse Owens. Because um, if I ever had a son, I was going to get called after that. I'm very much into what he did in, um, you know, Hitler's time, which mm. just significant. And, you know, even Peter Norman to do what he did in the Olympics when it wasn't unpopular. And I'm a person who believes that sport should stand for something and and what you learn as a person and that's what we were talking about my book it is to be a champion you are a champion person it's no use if you're just going to be a champion in whatever you're doing your your legend might be there but it doesn't mean you've made a difference in life so those people 
Tell us about the book. The book is called Think, Prepare, Play Like a Champion. Um, it's for parents, anything, and if you get it, you, you you can watch some of my podcasts or my my things on YouTube so you can actually see it in more depth and you get fridge magnets to put on. The old you fridge magnet. Oh, yeah, you get <laughs> worksheets to do. And one of the things I'll tell people is you learn about one excuse, two new plans. One excuse when things go wrong, the excuse is to keep your self-confidence, keep yourself feeling okay. The two new plans are to get you better. So rather than just telling someone off, I always tell my athletes, if people get stuck into you, you need to say, here's my excuse to stay big, but here's my two new plans so we'll get better. What's your definition of happiness? Usually living life with my husband, my family, my friends. It's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Look, blessed, without a doubt, but blessed with also going there is always a better way. Keep trying to find it. Okay. Thank you for coming in and sharing those thoughts. Uh, As you do so brilliantly, we could talk for hours, and I just (laughs) love the way in which you are enriching me and from the reactions we've got from the audience, you're doing that just as well. Jenny Williams, thank you for having a chat to us this afternoon and to you and Mark, who's... I don't think he's concentrating on the interview out there. He's doing a lot of laughing. but <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what our life is about, that's doing a, a lot of thing. laughing. All right. Thank you, Jenny. It's wonderful for me to have a chance to talk to you as always, and you take care. Thanks, Pete. Bye.